Hello there, everybody! Bunna here, and welcome to the Absolute Beginner's Guide to Ark Survival Evolved. With the release of Ark Genesis Part 2 right around the corner, I figured an all-inclusive beginner's guide to the game would be really useful for new or returning players. I mean, my 4300 hours of in-game time has surely taught me something that I can share with all of you, right? Right. Jesus Christ! I've tried my best to organize the video into different subsections that can be easily understood and digested. For easy access and referral back to each of these subsections, I've included the list on screen and then a description of this video with corresponding links to each of the timestamps. If you find this video helpful or entertaining, please be sure to leave it a like down below and subscribe for more content just like this. Alright, so let's dive right into things. Upon joining a new ARC for the first time, whether it be an official server, an unofficial server, dedicated session, non-dedicated session, or even a single player world, you'll be greeted with the character creation screen. Now in a lot of games out there, character creation can play a massive part in your gameplay experience and change a lot of core gameplay components. In Ark, this is entirely not the case. In fact, the design of your character actually plays very little part in impacting anything you will do, so by all means experiment and make whatever abomination you care to create. With that being said, there is a small benefit to making your character a female and dialing the sliders all the way down as small as you can, as the hitbox for your character will shrink accordingly and could give you an advantage in PvP fights. This really only applies to close quarter fights, or if you're trying to hide from other players though, so in the end game content it really doesn't matter too much. Please note that if you decide to take the opposite route and make your character ungodly large or disproportioned, your hitbox will be larger and you'll be an easier target. Also, some of the armor pieces won't fit you properly, it'll look like your fat rolls are starting to slowly eat the other portions of your body and matter around you, resulting in an abysmal vortex of suffocation that- So once you're in game for the first time, you'll be greeted with this very long, unnecessary cutscene, where your player looks around and begins scratching at his wrist like a damn drug addict. When the cutscene ends, you'll be able to see the full UI that displays all of your character's important information. On the bottom right-hand side of your screen is your current health, stamina, food, water, weight, and progress towards your next level. On the very bottom of your screen is the hotbar where you can place tools, weapons, and usable items. The UI will also display environmental information in the bottom right-hand corner, such as if you're too hot or too cold, or if you're suffering the effects of a storm, but this information is only present if it has a negative effect on your character. Additional information can be displayed in the top left-hand corner of the zone you're currently in by pressing and holding the H key. Your inventory can be accessed by pressing the corresponding key binding, which is I by default, but I usually rebind this to tab due to habits from different games. Inside your inventory's UI, you can view things like your current armor, level, experience, the tribute points, the crafting menu, and of course your character's current inventory. I would recommend playing around with some of the functionality and organizational options in here to get yourself accustomed to all the mechanics. For the most part, Ark follows many of the basic controls that other games have. Movement is standard WASD, spacebar is jump, C key is crouch, X is prone, E is used to interact with the environment and objects, and F can be used to access inventories of objects or tamed creatures. The left mouse button is used to engage the primary action of whatever you're carrying, like swinging a sword or shooting a gun. The right mouse button is used to engage the secondary action, like blocking with a shield or aiming down the sights. The middle mouse button can be scrolled to switch between first person and third person mode. Next, let's discuss the experience and level system in Ark and showcase some of the different areas that you can spend your attribute points. Experience is gained by harvesting resources, crafting items, killing creatures, taming creatures, or by finding various explorer notes and dossiers scattered around the maps. When you receive enough experience points for your current level, you will level up and be awarded one attribute point to spend. You must invest your awarded attribute points in order to visibly level up and also receive the engram points associated with that gained level. There are multiple categories to invest your attribute points that can heavily affect your gameplay and personal playstyle. Health will increase your natural health pool, meaning that you can sustain more damage before your character dies. Stamina increases your natural stamina pool and means that you can run, swim, or perform manual actions such as harvesting or using melee weapons for longer periods of time. Oxygen increases your natural oxygen pool and means that you can remain underwater for longer periods of time before needing to resurface for air, and also increases your movement speed while in the water. Food and water increases your natural pool so that your character can store more food and water at any given time. Weight reflects how much weight your character can carry before becoming encumbered or unable to move. Melee damage increases how much damage you inflict with melee weapons and how many resources you will gather with manual tools. Movement speed affects how fast your character will walk, sprint, or swim. Crafting skill increases how quickly you can craft items within your character's inventory and can further increase the quality of items when crafting with blueprints. And finally, fortitude increases your character's natural resistance to environmental effects, torpidity, and disease. While there is no quote-unquote perfect way to invest your points, a healthy balance across the board is probably the best way to approach things, especially if you're a new player. About the only categories I would avoid would be oxygen, food, and water, as these attributes can be pretty worthless unless you're going for a very specific build type. 
With each level that you acquire, you will also be awarded engram points that can be spent within the engrams menu to learn new things to craft. Certain engrams can only be unlocked once you've reached a certain level, and will cost a specific amount of engram points to learn. Just be sure to spend your points wisely, because it's really easy to blow through all of them before realizing there's something super important you should have learned, but now I've used all of your available points because you wanted a massive bongo set on top of your thatch hut. Blueprints are a way of crafting items without having the base engram learned, and are oftentimes sought after due to the higher quality of items that they can produce. You can even craft items from other expansion maps if you have the proper blueprint and resources available. Blueprints are most often acquired from supply drops, loot crates, or special events like on Genesis. Blueprints are directly augmented by the player's crafting skill, meaning that the higher the crafting skill has a chance of further improving the quality of the item that the blueprint can produce. So now that we've covered the basics of leveling, investing attribute points, and engram points, let's talk about the survival aspects of Ark. Food and water play a massive role in the game and must be kept in constant balance while you're playing. And believe me, if they're not, your character will let you know. Here is a list of all the currently available food types in Ark. You can find early game food by picking berries from bushes and plants by walking up to them and pressing E. Then simply open up your inventory, hover over the stack, and press and hold the E to quickly consume the whole stack. Just be careful not to eat narco berries or stim berries, because they can have some negative effects on you. Once you're able to craft weapons, you'll be able to kill some of the more docile creatures like dodos and parasaurs to acquire some raw meat. You can place this raw meat inside of a campfire to cook it, which is much more sustainable and lighter food to carry around than berries. Custom recipes can also be created inside of a cooking pot, and are directly augmented by your character's crafting skill, meaning the higher your crafting skill, the better the recipe will become. Water can be acquired by either swimming in pools deep enough to fully submerge in, or by standing in water and pressing E. You can also craft water skins, water jars, or canteen to store water in your character for later use. You can gain water by eating berries as well, however the amount that you gain is very minimal and your water level will rise very slowly. Once you've set up a base of ops later down the road, running a pipe from a water source to your base may be a good idea to make survival easier, but just know that this is a glowing beacon for other players to follow and find your base. Insulation plays an important role in survival as well. Your character's hyperthermic and hypothermic insulation values can be viewed within your inventory's UI. These values indicate how resistant you will be to hot and cold temperatures. The higher the values, the better your resistance will become. Things like armor, air conditioners, or even certain tames can help you increase your insulation values and protect you from the weather. Shelter plays an important role in insulating your character as well. Being inside of a building will drastically reduce your character's exposure to the elements and protect you from aggressive creatures. Outside of Scorched Earth, the type of base that you're inside doesn't seem to matter in terms of insulative properties. For example, a wooden base in a coal biome doesn't provide any additional hypothermic insulation that a stone or metal base does. The tents introduced with Scorched Earth provide a massive insulation buff once you're inside, oftentimes completely negating any outside weather or storms. So let's quickly dive into some of the important resources that you're probably going to need to know about. Most resources are gathered more efficiently by using certain tools or tames, but we'll get into that more in just a moment. Here is a list of all the important resources you will need to know. Rocks will yield stone and flint. Trees will yield wood and thatch. Metal nodes will yield metal and stone. Obsidian nodes will yield obsidian and metal. Crystal nodes will yield crystal and stone. Oil nodes will yield oil and stone. And pearls will yield, well, pearls. There are other resources on Ark that you'll have to know about at some point, but for the sake of keeping this tutorial easy to understand, I've chosen to leave out information about DLC-specific resources, like sand or gems. Just know that these resources are often harvested in the same fashion as everything else, and don't really vary too much from the norm, so when you have a base understanding of the game's harvesting mechanics, you can pretty quickly figure out what to do to harvest them. Alright, so now that we've tackled some of the core components of Ark, let's get into the fun stuff. Surviving an arc revolves around crafting tools, weapons, and armor to progress your character farther into the game. As you use these tools and weapons, or your armor takes damage in a fight, the durability of the item will slowly decrease. If the durability is left to reach zero, the item will break and can no longer be used until it's repaired. Items can be repaired either within your character's inventory UI, or with any appropriate crafting station provided you have all the necessary resources. Simply right-click on the item, and choose Repair. Let's start off by talking about tools. Here is a list of all the available tools in the game so far. As a general rule of thumb, pickaxes are good at gathering flint, thatch, meat, metal, crystal, and obsidian. Hatchets are good at gathering wood, hide, chitin, and stone. Sickles can be used to gather fiber, raw prime fish meat, and certain plants more efficiently. 
There are of course better tools you'll be getting as you level up, or even tame creatures that can harvest for you, but you will likely always want to have a set of tools on you at any point in time to make survival easier. You should start out by crafting yourself a stone pickaxe as soon as possible. You can pick up stones from on the ground, pick fiber from nearby bushes, and punch a tree to get the wood you need. Once you've acquired all the necessary resources, you can craft it under the crafting tab within your inventory's UI. Next, you'll want to unlock the stone hatchet engram and use your stone pickaxe on a rock nearby to acquire flint. Then you can go back into the crafting tab and craft yourself a stone hatchet. These tools will at least get you started so you can begin progressing towards the metal tier tools in the near future. Now let's talk about weapons and what you can use to defend yourself. Here is a list of all of the current weapons in the game. Just know that it's best to have a mix of both ranged weaponry and melee weaponry to tackle some of the fights that you're going to get into, especially early on. Some enemies just simply can't be killed effectively with a melee weapon, and conversely some fights can't be won with just a ranged weapon. Start out by unlocking the Stone Spear Engram once you have enough Engram points, and use your newfound tools to get all the resources necessary. You can craft the Stone Spear within the crafting tab of your inventory's UI. You want to make multiple spears because these guys have a tendency to break pretty easily during a fight. Once you're high enough level to unlock bolos and the bow and arrows, you should start working towards crafting these, as it will greatly increase your chances of survival. You can use these newfound weapons to kill some of the smaller wildlife to begin accumulating hide, which is a resource you're going to need for better tools, weapons, and armor. Bolos are an absolute godsend early on, and can be used to ensnare docile creatures so you can kill them easier, or some of the smaller aggressive creatures so that you can kill them or make an escape. Alright, so let's dive into the topic of armor. Here is a list of all the current armor types in the game so far. In summary, there are 11 different types of armor in the game, all of which have unique stats and uses depending upon the area of the game you're playing in, or your preferred playstyle. Cloth gear is the weakest of the armor types and has the lowest durability, however offers decent hypothermic insulation for some of the warmer areas in the game. Hide gear offers a decent balance of armor, durability, and hypothermic insulation, making it a good choice early on for exploration purposes. Fur gear offers fairly high armor, durability, and hypothermic insulation, making it a great choice for some of the coldest regions in the game. As a downside though, this gear is really heavy and expensive to craft early on given the resources required. Desert cloth gear can only be obtained on Scorched Earth or other DLC packs where silk can be obtained. It offers decent armor, durability, and hypothermic insulation. Gilly gear offers a great balance of armor, durability, and hypothermic insulation. On top of this, it has a passive effect where it reduces the radius in which wild aggressive creatures will see you, making it a great choice for early exploration or taming. Chitin gear offers a balance between armor and durability, however has a negative hypothermic insulation stat. Flak gear is by far some of the best gear in the game to acquire, offering a hefty armor bonus and good durability. As a downside, it offers a negative hypothermic insulation stat, is rather costly to make, and is rather heavy to wear all the time. Hazard suit gear can only be crafted on Arc Aberration or other DLC packs where blue gems and congeal gas balls can be acquired. It does offer a decent balance of armor, durability, and hyperthermic insulation, however it has a very specific use in the game that I don't think you need to worry about right now. Scuba gear is required for underwater exploration. While it has a very low armor value, it offers decent durability and hyperthermic insulation. Riot gear offers some of the highest armor value in the game and decent durability however is extremely heavy and offers a negative hypothermic insulation value. On top of this, it is very expensive to craft and repair, so many players don't even bother with this tier of armor. Lastly is Tech Gear, which is by far the best armor in the game. It offers fantastic armor value, decent durability, and a very high insulation stat, all while weighing less than the flak armor does. The downside to this armor is that it is very difficult to obtain, requiring numerous boss battles to unlock all the engrams and a ton of endgame resources in order to craft. In summary, the main stats that you want to look for in your gear is the armor value, durability, and insulation values. Resource cost to craft or repair should also be taken into consideration. We'll begin by unlocking the appropriate cloth armor engrams and using the fiber from bushes you picked to craft it within the crafting tab. As you level up, you'll gain access to the better types of armor that we just discussed. Alright, so let's say you've got yourself a stone pickaxe, stone hatchet, and a full set of cloth armor with some weapons to work with. So now what? Well, you probably want to start building a base to keep all of your valuables and provide you with a respawn point in case you die. There are currently six tiers of structures in the game, including adobe, however only five are really used outside of Scorched Earth. Thatch is the weakest of the structures, however is also the easiest to make. Sometimes it's beneficial to start with a thatch base just to simply get started and store some of your belongings. It's also good to craft thatch structures to level your character up faster. 
Towards the end game, thatch is really only used to map out builds before you invest valuable resources into a building project. You won't want to stay in a thatch building for too long, as they can be easily raided by other players or even destroyed by aggressive creatures. Wood is the next tier of structure, however it is still quite weak and vulnerable to enemy players. Metal tools, enemy tames, or explosives can easily chew through these structures, so I would recommend moving past this building tier as soon as you can. Wood structures do provide a lot of experience when crafting, though, so just like making thatch structures, they can be very useful for leveling your character up. Adobe structures fall somewhere between wood tier and stone tier. They provide protection against intense heat and occasional storms on scorched earth, however are pretty pointless and very difficult or impossible to make in other maps. Unless you're starting out playing on Scorched Earth, which I really wouldn't recommend, I suggest not even worrying about this tier of structure. Stone is the next tier of structure and provides a medium level of protection from raiders and creatures. Stone is the tier that you want to shoot for early on, as the resources are fairly easy to get and it provides a solid level of defense in the early game. While it is technically possible to raid a stone tier of base with metal tools, it would be very time consuming and pointless. Explosives are very effective against stone tier though, so your goal will still be to continue upgrading to improve your chances of survival. Metal is one of the highest tiers of structures and provides exceptional defense to enemy raiders and tames. Explosives are still capable of destroying metal structures, of course, but to much lesser extents than the previous tiers. The only downside to metal structures is that they can be rather costly in terms of resources and kind of scream, hey, I have resources, to all the other players. Lastly is tech tier, which is currently the most defensible and sought after tier in the game. These structures are extremely costly and time-consuming to make, requiring you to complete boss battles across different maps to unlock all the required engrams and farm element in order to craft them. They provide the most defense of any structures in the game and are extremely resistant towards all forms of damage. There are other types of structures in the game as well, such as tents, cliff platforms, tree platforms, rafts, and even platform saddles for various creatures. Most of the time the same quality of tier is followed throughout, meaning thatch is the lowest quality and tech is the highest quality. So if you see a stone cliff platform, it's going to be much lower tier than a metal cliff platform. A base is classifiably one foundation, a door frame with a door, three walls, and a ceiling over top. At the bare minimum, this is what you'll need to protect yourself and your items. However, this is usually too small to operate out of, especially when you first begin placing storage and crafting stations. I would recommend building at least a 3x3x2 base, meaning three foundations wide, by three foundations long, and two walls high. This will give you adequate enough space inside to begin adding all the crafting stations and storage you will need to keep progressing. To start out building your own base, simply unlock all the engrams appropriate for your level, gather the necessary resources, and navigate towards the crafting tab to begin crafting them. I would recommend starting with the thatch tier and working your way up, because this will not only help you learn the building system of Ark, but will also give you loads of experience in the process. Foundations are the starting blocks for building a base and are necessary to begin building early on. To build a base, craft yourself some foundations and begin placing them where you would like your base to be. To place the foundation, simply place the item on your hotbar and press the appropriate key binding, or navigate into your inventory and press the E key on the structure. Once you have it oriented where you would like to place it, press the left mouse button to place it down. You will have 30 seconds to pick the structure back up if you're not satisfied where it's snapped to. Be careful not to build on a surface that is too steep, as this may prevent you from placing the foundations where you want them to be. You could attach a ceiling to the foundation to increase the footprint size of your base if you need to, but just know that this is limited to two ceiling distances away from the foundation you're snapping to. Pillars could be used underneath of the ceiling to provide structural support from below, which would allow you to further extend your base. Next you will need to attach a door frame with a door, walls, and a ceiling to fully seal in your new base. These structures will snap to the existing foundations that you have placed, making building rather easy, albeit janky sometimes. So now that you have your very own base, let's discuss some of the important early game stations that you're going to need to put inside of it. Just like everything else in this video so far, you're going to need to navigate into the Engrams tab and unlock the appropriate Engrams once you've met the level requirement. Storage boxes will be useful to craft in order to store some of your heavier resources that are difficult to carry around, such as wood or stone. I would recommend placing a few of these in your base just so that you can start to bank some resources that you're going to be needing very shortly. Next, I would recommend crafting a refining forge. Refining forges are used to smelt raw metal into metal ingots, which can be used to craft other important structures and better tools and armor. Place this inside your base, add some fuel like wood or thatch, and throw any raw metal you've acquired inside. Press the turn on option within the refining forges menu to begin smelting the raw metal into metal ingots. The next structure you're going to want to make is a smithy, as it's essential to making better weapons and armor. Once you have your smithy crafted, place it down somewhere within your base as tight to the wall as you can. You can even remove one of the walls in order to get the smithy tighter to the inside walls of your base. Just make sure to replace the wall when you're done to prevent anything from getting inside. Once you have the engrams unlocked, you can begin to craft higher tiers of items, weapons, and armor inside the smithy, provided you have the correct resources available. 
Next up, you should craft yourself a mortar and pestle, which is a small structure used to make narcotics, stimulants, spark powder, gunpowder, and more. It's essential to begin taming creatures and getting higher tiers of weapons to use in fights. Next, you'll want to make a preserving bin and a campfire in order to iron out your food situation. Think of the preserving bin as a refrigerator that can store food for longer periods of time before it expires. It requires spark powder in order to power it, which can be crafted inside of the mortar and pestle using flint and stone. I mentioned a campfire earlier in this video, but to reiterate its purpose, you can use it to cook raw meat for a better food source and use it to keep your character warm. In the end game, campfires are mainly used as charcoal farms, where you fill them up with wood and let them cook into charcoal for gunpowder production. Last, but definitely not least, you're going to want to craft a bed and place it inside your base. Beds act as respawn points for your character in case you die, and are essential for getting back on your feet quickly in case things go south, which in ARK happens all the f***ing time. Trust me. Now with all of this in mind, don't just build the base that I've demonstrated all these building mechanics on, because this thing looks like a hot piece of garbage. Wait a minute. Instead, build something small, defensible, and compact to improve your chances of survival, especially on PvP servers. If you happen to get raided, which let's be honest, it's going to happen, don't get discouraged. Instead, try to learn from your building mistakes and make the correct adjustments. There are forms of defense in the game that I haven't touched on yet, such as Plan X species, auto turrets, or even tames that can help defend your base from raiders. But I honestly believe that all of this stuff actually draws attention from raiders more than it deters them. Unless, of course, you have an obscene amount of them to defend your base, which if you're a new player, I'm guessing wouldn't be the case. My advice is to avoid these for the time being until you get a better feel for the game and establish a solid base of operations somewhere. So now we've come to the last category of the Beginner's Guide. Taming. Taming is one of the most unique and essential parts of Ark that separates it from all the other survival games out there. Many creatures in Ark have special abilities or unique characteristics that make them ideal in certain situations. For example, the Doodecarus excels at gathering stone, while the Ankylosaurus excels at gathering metal. Now I'm not going to dive into the different features for each creature, because that would literally take weeks to cover everything, but there is loads of information on the wiki page to help you better understand which creatures are better in certain situations. I've even made tutorials for a lot of the unique creatures on Extinction, Valguera, Genesis, and the Crystal Isles DLC if you care to check those out. <coughs> shameless, <laughs> shameless plug! <laughs> As a general rule of thumb, creatures are tamed in one of two ways. By knocking them out and feeding them food while they're unconscious, or by passively taming them. While there are other unique taming methods in the game, such as stealing eggs and raising the babies, anything you'll be taming at lower level will more than likely follow one of those basic taming methods. For knockout tames, you will need a method of knocking the creature unconscious, such as a bow or crossbow with tranquilizer arrows, or a long neck rifle with tranquilizer darts. You can technically use a slingshot with rocks to pull this off too, but I really wouldn't recommend it, as it's extremely inefficient and has a high chance of failure. In order to craft tranquilizer arrows, or darts, you will need to make narcotics in a mortar and pestle. Narcotics are made by combining narco berries and spoiled meat, and then can be combined with arrows or rifle ammunition to make the respective tranquilizer ammunition. Once you have all the ammo you need, find something to tame and shoot the thing in the face until it falls unconscious. I would highly recommend starting with a Parasaur, as these can be one of the easiest and most useful tames you can acquire at low levels. As a side note, many creatures can either be bullowed or trapped to immobilize them during the tranking process, which makes it a lot easier. Sometimes the area in which you shoot the creature affects how much torpor damage is dealt as well, so you may want to confer with the wiki page before you start tranking them. Once the creature's unconscious, you'll want to keep it knocked out by feeding it narco berries or narcotics. Simply open up its inventory, place the items inside, and use them like you would on your own character. Narco berries are oftentimes the better item to use because they will very slowly increase the torpidity of the creature they're being used on, essentially keeping the creature knocked out longer than narcotics would. You can view the creature's current torpidity level by looking at its unconscious body, or by opening up its inventory and looking on the bottom of the inventory tab. Just be sure to not ever hit the creature when it's unconscious, and protect it from other creatures that might try to harm it. If the creature gets hit when it's unconscious, it will lower the creature's taming effectiveness, meaning it will get fewer bonus levels when it actually tames out. This is why it's in best practice to either trap the creature first, or at the very least place spikes and walls around it to protect it. Just keeping the creature knocked out is not enough to tame it though. You will need to feed the creature some of its favorite foods in order to properly tame it. Each creature on Ark has its own food preferences, and some foods are better than others. As a general rule of thumb, herbivores are going to prefer berries, crops, and other organic types of food, while carnivores will prefer raw mutton, raw prime, or regular raw meat. This isn't always the case though, and there are a lot of creatures that require unique or crafted foods, so your best bet is to research the creature before knocking it out to figure out what kind of foods you should be feeding it. The Ark Wiki and YouTube are both great sources of information for discovering out unique taming methods and proper foods to feed certain creatures. When you've knocked the creature out and provided it with one of its favorite foods, it's pretty much just a waiting game until the creature tames. 
unconscious creatures will slowly starve down, meaning that their maximum food will slowly decrease over time. It will take a bite of food at set intervals when its maximum food is decreased enough. With each bite that the creature takes, it will gain progress towards taming it, but will also decrease its taming effectiveness. The more bites that the creature takes, the lower the effectiveness will be. This is why it's recommended to use better foods for the creature, as it will take less bites and tame with more bonus levels than otherwise. There is a common method of taming out there where you can starve down the creature without actually taming it. So essentially, you knock out the creature, increase its torpidity, and walk away. Its food will slowly decrease over time, so when you finally do add food to its inventory, it will pretty much instantly tame on the spot. This method is useful if you're taming the creature in a dangerous area and don't want to waste the food attempting to tame it, only to have it die when it's close to being tamed. Aside from knocking creatures out, there are passive tames in the game as well, meaning that they're tamed non-violently. Typically, the favorite food of the creature is placed in the last slot of your hotbar, then you can sneak up behind the creature and press E to feed it. Simply repeat this process until taming is complete. Just like with any other tame, the favorite food of the creature varies, so make sure you research things before jumping into the taming process. Gilly Armor is great for passively taming creatures, as it will reduce the range in which creatures notice your presence. Bug Repellent can also be really useful too, especially if the creature you're taming happens to be near a swamp or redwood region where there's a lot of insects. In some cases, it's even required for the creature you're trying to passively tame. So once your creature is fully tame, you'll be able to take advantage of all of the special abilities. Typically, a saddle is required to ride any kind of tame, however, this isn't always the case. If a saddle is required, you will need to unlock the appropriate engram and craft the saddle at the proper crafting station. There is a radial menu for every creature that can be accessed by approaching it and holding down the E key. From here, you can name it, set it to obey commands, and change some of its general functions. There are also whistle commands that can be used to quickly change your tamed creature's behaviors. Although there are a lot of whistles in the game, the only ones that you really need to know are T to command a single creature to follow, and Y in order to command it to stop. You can also access a whistle radial menu by holding down the T key and choosing the correct whistle that you'd like. When you're riding the creature, if it has that capability, many of the controls remain the same as on foot, with the exception of any special abilities it might have. As with anything else, it's best to research what a creature can do before setting out to tame it. Oftentimes, special abilities are simply passive, such as the case with the Ankylosaurus gathering flint more efficiently. However, some abilities are actively engaged, like the Parasaur's enemy detection ability. I also want to quickly mention that breeding and mating play a big part in progressing farther in Ark. I don't believe it's important to know all the details, especially if you're brand new to the game, but it's helpful to know some stuff and what's involved. Basically, when you have two creatures of the same species and opposite genders that love each other very much, but no, seriously, you can make creatures together to produce an offspring that has a combination of the stats and appearances that the mother and father have. This can be done by accessing the radio wheel of each creature and setting Enable Mating. The mating process will take a short amount of time and increases in intervals similar to how the taming process works. At the end of the mating process, the creatures you're breeding will either lay a fertilized egg that can be incubated and hatched, or become impregnated and give live birth to the creature after a certain amount of time has passed. Either way, once the baby is born, it must be claimed in order to properly raise it. If you imprint the creature as it's growing up, it will gain additional damage, damage resistance, and movement speed once it's fully grown, making them invaluable when they're an adult. Imprinting a baby varies depending upon the specific creature. At set intervals, it will require certain actions to properly imprint it, such as one of its favorite foods, or going on a walk. 100% imprint is obviously the goal, however it's not always possible and definitely a very hard achievement in the early game. Alright, well that about wraps up this whole beginner's guide, start to finish. I hope that everybody watching found it to either be helpful, or at the very least entertaining. Thank you so much for watching! If you enjoyed the video, please be sure to leave it a like down below, subscribe to the channel if you're brand new, and leave me comments because they warm my little bonnet heart. Be sure to check out the other content on my channel as well, and feel free to join my Discord channel to chat with all the other bonnets. Thank you again for watching, and I will see you next time!